All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, good morning. Uh, my name is Fred Hoff. I'm the uh, director of the Atlantic Council's Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, this morning to join us uh, for this discussion. Uh, please join the conversation on Twitter and Facebook for this event with hashtag AC Iraq. Today's event comes at, uh, at an important juncture. Last month, voters in the KRG overwhelmingly voted yes to independence in a referendum. Uh, the vote has put Kurdish authorities on a collision course with the central government in Baghdad. Recently, the Iraqi Council of Representatives approved several punitive measures against the KRG for going ahead with the vote. As we've also seen, the referendum has regional and international implications for the United States. Though the ultimate impact of the referendum is uncertain, what is certain is that the Kurdish issue must be addressed as part of a number of issues that confront Iraq as it tries to rebuild its economy, address social and political grievances, and ensure regional peace and security. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us today a distinguished panel of experts who can help us better understand the background and the implications of this referendum controversy and its relationship to the balance of difficult issues facing Iraq. Dr. Hadith al Kawari is a resident, non resident senior fellow here at the Hariri Center who will be leading our Iraq work. He is also a fellow at the Central University. Uh, Central European University in Budapest. He was formerly a lecturer at Baghdad University and a fellow at Harvard University in Brandeis. Uh, we hope within the next several weeks uh, to formally launch the Iraq program, which Hadith will be leading. Hadith, welcome. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. Ambassador Stuart Jones is the is a brand new vice president at the Cohen Group. Uh, he was a career member of the U.S. Foreign Service and was appointed acting S Secretary of State for Near East in January of this year. Ambassador Jones had previously uh, served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in NEA since October 2016. Ambassador Jones was the uh, U.S. Ambassador to Iraq from 2014 to 2016 Ambassador to Jordan from 2011 to 2014. He has extensive experience in Iraq. He was Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad in 2010-2011, Government Coordinator in Anbar Province in 2004, and Country Director for Iraq at the National Security Council staff. Stu, thanks very much uh, for being with us today. And finally, uh, Dr. Denise Natali is the Director and Distinguished Research Fellow of the Center for Strategic Research at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, where she specializes in Iraq, transborder Kurdish issues, and post-conflict stabilization. Uh, she'll be teaching a course on uh, a class on post-conflict stabilization this afternoon, which means that we have to uh, conclude promptly at uh, 1230. Uh, Dr. Natali joined INSS in January 2011 as the Minerva Chair following more than two decades of researching and working in the Kurdish regions of Iraq, Turkey, Iran, and Syria. What I'd like to do now is have a conversation with our panelists, uh, and then we'll turn to questions from you again. Thanks very much uh, for having taken the time to join us today. Uh, we will uh, we'll forego the, uh, the formality of, uh, of opening statements and the like. I'm just going to pose some questions, and uh, we'll have a conversation up here. We'll keep it as, uh, as informal and as uh, informative as we possibly can. Uh, Hadith, let me, uh, let me begin with you, if I may. For a, long, for a long time now, the focus 
of virtually all of the parties in Iraq has been on the military neutralization of Daesh, ISIS. Uh, that goal seems nearly at hand. So why, why now? Why now in terms of this referendum? Why was the focus on Daesh not sufficient uh, to keep Erbil and Baghdad on the same page? Thank you very much, uh, Fred. Uh, I think at, at the beginning we need uh, to view the current crisis between Kurdistan regional government and the federal government in Baghdad in light of uh, some uh, more substantial problems in, in the way that Iraqi policy and Iraqi politics uh, have been functioning in the last years. Uh, problems such as the weak institutions, uh, the prevailing of de facto politics over constitutional process, uh, the failure to agree on, uh, in, in, on uh, sustainable and effective way of sharing uh, resources in a country that is highly dependent on oil. So I think the, the current cri crisis is uh, an outcome of those more substantial problems. Uh, among the Kurdish uh, leadership, uh, the, there was a conviction that the po political system that has been established after 2003 is not working anymore. Uh, Masoud Barzani, the president of Kurdistan region, famously stated in 2014 after ISIS took over Mosul and other cities that uh, the state of Iraq that we knew is over and now there are new borders that are being uh, demarcated with the blood. Even uh, other Kurdish leaders who are probably uh, uh, on a more moderate position in the Kurdish political spectrum, such as Barham Saleh, a former prime minister of Kurdistan, had repeatedly, repeatedly said that uh, uh, post-2003 Iraq is over and we need to renegotiate a new compact. And I think this Kurdish uh, step to conduct the referendum was a, man a manifestation of this conviction that the system is no longer working and we need to do something else. And this conviction is not, of course, baseless. Uh, if you look at the Iraqi constitution, uh, that was actually uh, an outcome of a deal between Kurdish nationalist party, uh, parties and Shia Islamist parties. Uh, there was an article in the Constitution, Article 140, that stated that uh, by 2007, the, the, uh, the status of disputed territories, uh, the, the, the territories that both Kurdistan and Baghdad claim should be normalized and uh, de de determined. This hasn't happened. Uh, there are uh, more than 12 articles in the Iraqi constitution that stipulate the authorities of the federal government, the, uh, the, uh, the regional government, and the shared authorities of the two. But it's been years since uh, the two parties had adopted different interpretations of those articles, and they parted ways in, in, in their way of uh, putting those articles uh, into action. And even the, 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 uh, the, only, the only institution that was supposed, constitutionally was supposed to address this type of dispute, the federal court, uh, stopped being reliable and a credible arbiter for the two sides, which is why I'm, I'm, I, I think we need to, uh, to, to highlight the component of the weakness of, of institution. But having said that, the same criticisms that uh, Kurdish leadership has for Baghdad could be directed at Kurdistan itself. You have the same problems. You have weak institutions. You have an oil-dependent government. You have a prevailing of de facto politics over constitutional process. Um, and to, be, to, to, to go back to your question, uh, Fred, 
since it became clear that ISIS was losing the war, the parties that were fighting ISIS made it their priority to reshape realities on the ground in order to enter the next phase of conflict from an advantageous position. And the Kurdish, uh, the, the, this is particularly true in the case of the competition between the Kurdish Peshmerga and the Shia popular, popular mobilization forces, PMF. And I think the fact that the Kurdish Peshmerga managed to take control over very important areas in the, in the disputed territories, in Sinjar, in uh, Ninawa Plain, and asserted their control in Kirkuk, which is because of its oil wealth, is very, uh, very important, very critical if the, if, if the Kurds want to have their own state. I think this factor has been an important motive for the Kurdish leadership to conduct the, the referendum and to de demand independence now because they, 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 they thought that it is also in a way uh, uh, the beginning of a road to legalize and validate their control in the disputed uh, territories. Finally, also there is the element of the internal Kurdish politics. Kurdistan has been going through political crisis, uh, constitutional stalemate, economic crisis, and I think the leaders of uh, uh, the Kurdistan Democratic Party, KDP, Barzani and uh, the other le leaders thought that by conducting the referendum now and reviving the dream of the statehood, they will be able to rally and mobilize Kurdish po population. And it is un unquestionable among, I mean, the, the dream of the state is, 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 is very, it's strongly embraced by, by most of the Kurds. But they thought that this is a way to re-legitimize their leadership of the, of the region having failed to, to deal with the crisis that I just uh, described, to weaken their rivals because any of their internal rivals cannot dare to oppose uh, the dream of the Kurdish independence and to assert their control in the region. And that actually has happened when you look at the, uh, at, at the other parties, the opposition party, Goran, could not oppose the, the independence. The other historic rival and sometimes partner of the KDP, the Patriotic uh, Union of Kurdistan, PUK, has been div deeply div divided into different factions. Hadrath, if I could, if I could just, yes. if I could just break in here, you 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 alluded to the uh, to the reaction of some of the Arab parties, some of the Arab political tendencies in Iraq. Could you could you characterize that more more broadly? Is 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 opposition to Kurdish independence something that that unites all Iraqi Arabs? Are there are there shades of are there shades of difference? What uh, what kind of option does uh, does Prime Minister Abadi have uh, going forward here? Yes, uh, I think this is a very important question. Uh, in general, if you look at the de decisions that has been taken by the Iraqi parliament it, uh, uh, to penalize the Kurdish leadership because what is perceived in among the Arab population as a unilateral step uh, taken by Barzani, uh, there, there was unusual uh, consensus among uh, Sunni and Shia parties. Uh, in, 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 some, in some instances, the, the, the parliament was even more hawkish than the Iraqi government in terms of divan, demanding stronger action by Abadi's government. But in the last, f let's say, few days, uh, I think it, it became clear that they are, there are different uh, uh, positions and interpretations of what should be done and what should, what should be Baghdad's policy. Uh, among Sunni parties, there is an, an internal conversation. Some Sunni politicians think that it is wrong to fully support the Shia-dominated government because at the end, some of the grievances that KRG has expressed, expressed is actual, are actually shared by the Sunni parties. And it's better for the Sunni parties to uh, to take uh, a position in the middle 
to have more leverage because at the end, the Iraqi constitution in 2003 was passed through the alliance, the Kurdish Shia alliance, and I think that since this alliance is fallen now, probably it is in their interest to try uh, to take advantage of the differences between the Shia parties and uh, the, the, the Kurdish leadership. Uh, hence, we saw, for example, the Sunni vice president, Osama Nujayfi, the speaker of parliament, who's also uh, um, a senior Sunni politician, Salim al Jaburi, visited Erbil recently, and they tried to distance their uh, attitudes from that of the Iraqi government. Uh, they called for de escalation. So the, 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 uh, there are some uh, disagreements among the, the, the Arab uh, parties. If you look at Abadi, I think for Abadi, this crisis is, has, is, is both an opportunity and a challenge. An opportunity because it is for the first time in years that uh, Kurdish leadership is, is, is strongly criticized publicly, let's not say strongly, but publicly criticized by the United States and other Western countries, and also by uh, important regional actors, uh, Turkey and Iran. And for him, this is uh, a good opportunity to strengthen the position of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, KRG. In his speech at the Iraqi parliament, he repeatedly said that we have the support of the international community. We told the Kurdish leaders that if you want to put the international community in the position uh, of choosing be between you and us, they will choose us. Uh, also, the fact that Turkish-Kurdish relationships relationship is is in its, its, in its lower point today is also encouraging for Abadi because those who have been following the uh, rapprochement between Ankara and Ar Arbil and the role of Turkey in, 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 in Kurdistan understand that Turkey has been very uh, important actor in encouraging uh, KRG's independence from Baghdad for the sake of increasing KRG dependence on, on Ankara. Uh, so he also viewed this as an opportunity to try to uh, stre strengthen the position of the federal government. But at the same time, it's a challenge because unlike uh, the war against ISIS, in which the Iraqi government has the full support of the international community, in, was, in which the, the option was clear. There was one single option, which is fight and win that war. This one, this crisis is more complicated and less predictable. He cannot make big mistakes. He understands that. Uh, so this is very challenging. Uh, it's, it's true that Western countries, the United States, objected the Kurdish referendum because it's not the right time, because we have to focus on the war against ISIS. But this objection is not a blank check to Abadi to do whatever he wants. So he, he also understand there is there is a room for action, but that action should not take radical uh, forms. And it's a challenge also because, uh, in, uh, because of the dynamic in his own camp, especially the Shia camp, bec uh, be because he's facing also the hardliners who are uh, demanding more uh, assertive action. For example, military, uh, military action in Kirkuk and the disputed uh, territories. And uh, he's, he's accused by them of being very weak. So he needs to, to, to appear strong and tough to stand against Barazani's uh, unilateral decision in order not to let the hard hardliners in his own uh, base is, uh, steal a show. And this is also a very de delicate balance to... to so, so Harith, you, you alluded to the fact that this is a complicated uh, crisis and uh, its outcome is, uh, is very unpredictable. But, but what, what do you see as plausible scenarios going forward? Are we, are we headed toward armed conflict? Is there, is there room for this to be, uh, to be, for this to be settled uh, through negotiations? I think uh, we should be wor worried, of course, because any, any miscalculated move might lead to a new conflict. But I, 
in general, I think sooner or later that the two sides realize that the cost of negotiation is less than the cost of conflict. And uh, already Barzani, uh, in his speech after the, the referendum, even before the referendum, he said, we're going to negotiate uh, with Baghdad about having a new, a new framework of, of relations between the two sides. And for Barzani, it's simply the fact that he held the referendum despite of the objection of Baghdad and other regional and international actors. This is by itself a political victory. He, he, he achieved some, let's say, short-term political gains that provided him with some capital to work on. Understandably, Baghdad is saying, no, we cannot negotiate now because it, it, it will seem as, we, uh, as if we are, we, we are accepting the referendum and its outcome. And I think what Abadi is trying to do now is to alter the balance of power uh, in order to, at some stage, in, enter the negotiation from uh, a better position. And I just wanted to indicate uh, something here. I want to interrupt. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, shall I continue? So uh, if, if, if you follow the discourse of the Kurdish leaders, I, th I, I think uh, for Barzani and many Kurdish leaders, they think that the paradigm of the political system, of post-2003 political system, the paradigm of power sharing is no longer uh, acceptable. Barzani said it many times. We're not going to, to play this game anymore. The partner partnership in Baghdad, they do work. And what they, what they are trying to do is to change the paradigm. And the paradigm that they are calling for, in my understanding, is the paradigm of sovereignty sharing. This is why many of the Kurdish leaders have been talking about confederalism. In their view, that is, is if, if independence is impossible at this time, there has to be some kind of arrangement. A, a new, a new, th this is the new compact that, for example, Barham Saleh talked about. A compact that recognizes the realities on the ground, which is Kurdistan in, uh, was to a large extent independent in terms of its own security, in terms of, of its own institutions, politics, economy, and even foreign policy. What they want is to re-legitimize, re-legalize this, this sort of independence uh, through what they call confederalism, call it extreme federalism. And in my view, that even uh, people in Baghdad, uh, at least some of the more rational actors in Baghdad think they, they don't object giving Kurdistan more independence, or uh, they, they, they actually lived with this independence for years now. The problem here, the problem for them is the borders of this entity. The problem for them is the disputed territories. Would Kirkuk be part of that entity or will stay part of the federal auth uh, authority in Iraq? So for any international mediator, the, be the US, the UN, I think the, the, the best point to start with is to look at the disputed territories and to see if there is a way to address uh, the, the, the dispute there and to find some kind of arrangement of like shared authority as, as, as a point to start with if we want to imagine the negotiation uh, and the new compact. Uh, Thank you. I just wanted to um, interject a bit, and, and I agree with most all with what Harith said, but um, logically and rationally, the idea that the leaders will step back from conflict because they are rational and nobody wants conflict at that level. The problem is, and I was in the region just two weeks ago, about a week right before the referendum, is the leadership I, I do see is will be rational, but it's all of these undisciplined people, groups, militias that could benefit and take advantage of this very sensitive uh, issue. And that's what would be concerned to me, is that it's not that um, President Barzani or Prime Minister Abadi or at that level, they'll say, let's, let's tone it down. 
but all of these other militias in areas that could just spark something and that could lead to something else, like what happened in Mendeley when I was there in one of the disputed areas. Certainly these things can be dissolved, but when Iran says we're no longer going to pull off our militias or be, in, or, or, or be involved in mediating, that would be of concern to me. So I, I can't say that I would say that there's not going to be conflict because there's a lot of opportunities for people to take advantage of it. Um, I, I do want to make some comments, too, in addition to what Harrod said about the Arab, how some of the Arab communities would respond. And, and I'm not, again, I'm, th I would agree that there are many different voices. It, a lot of this depends on where you are, right? There is not one Sunni Arab area because the voices in Anbar were different than the people I spoke to in Salahuddin and from Mosul area. However, even some of those, let's just say, higher level Arab leaders and um, sheikhs in the Mosul area, living even in the Kurdistan region, would say the idea of a Kurdish state now becomes an ethnic state and what, what does that do for them? So you have to be careful about the inflaming extremes on both ends. And then when, when I was in Baghdad too, there was a lot of reaction again, and even, which actually brought Kurdish groups together. So Garan party inside the parliament, Garan is the opposition group, actually came together. What you don't want to see is to inflame extreme voices on both ends, and that is what this did. The, the question to me, what some folks brought up to me, some Arab spoke up, brought up to me was, what would we do uh, in the Kurdistan region, would we join the parliament? There's a million Arabs inside the Kurdistan region right now. So these would be some hard issues and hard questions to think about um, because it's not so neatly organized into a Kurdish ethnic state. And I know, understand they use the word Kurdistani and all of this bit. So there were some, and then finally, there was actually some strong voices across the spectrum, non-Kurdish that said under no conditions would these, dis these disputed territories are non-negotiable. And you don't want to get to that extreme, but we will definitely take these back in 10 years and, and all of this kind of language that who knows what is going to be followed through upon, but you'd want to tone down sensitivities. And so these were some of the concerns that I had when I left. And, 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 I ho and again, hopefully that they will be um, negotiated or, comp or, or compromise will come between those groups. Uh, Denise, thank you. Let's let's stay with the uh, with the Kurdish uh, side of the equation for for a moment here. Uh, from from the from the Kurdish standpoint, are we looking at a one way street leading ultimately to independence sooner or later? Are there shades of differences between various uh, KRG uh, political actors on this? Uh, some observers have argued that the referendum was really about strengthening the, uh, the internal political hand of President Barzani and his negotiating leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis Baghdad. Can you, can you sort this out for sure. us? Um, just as a general statement, I don't believe in one way anything in any parts of the world or the Middle East. I mean, modernization theory, you know, was this very neat argument that said, you put all these variables in, we'll end up here. And it's a very messy, right? And all we need is economic development and social development education, and well, you know, we're going to have this really modern place. And it didn't work out that way in many parts. So I, I don't buy unilateral forward-moving um, theories, and I don't think it's going to apply to the Kurdistan region, not because I don't think the Kurds don't deserve or merit self-determination, but that just doesn't work out. It's a very messy place. It's because the territory is landlocked, this would be a decision um, that would also be affected by regional states, Turkey and Iran, and the parent state of Baghdad. So that's another part of it. It's a regional geopolitical issue that's been going on for decades. And the part, uh, the question about the shades of difference Yes, there's a lot of differences in a lot of places. So even again, it's close to the 11th hour, there were groups within the region that didn't support, not that they didn't support Kurdish independence, but it was very difficult. Let's say the other main party, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, um, 
some, which is fractured at this moment, some of them didn't want to do this, that, that they didn't vote against it. And if you look at the parliament that came together at the 11th hour, I think of 111 seats, there were just, I don't know, 68 or 65 or 68 people that went. So this was a, a very, um, it wasn't an easy decision to put this together to vote for this. And I, I know that there's been, um, uh, figures out of 72% voted or 92% agreed. These are could be misleading if they're not broken down by territory, by locality. And if you look at Suleimania and places like Germion, um, they were lower than about 50%. That doesn't mean, again, that people didn't want self-determination. It does mean that the way that they look about having a state has a different sequence. And for those folks down there, it was, we want democratic institutions and we want institutions first before we have this. So those differences were playing out like even the day before the referendum. Even if the referendum wasn't happening, uh, there were differences and fragments across the region. And some concerns were made to me by different officials at, at higher levels that this would actually lead to greater divisions. So Harris is right. It, President Barzani, did, in the short term, it showed that he was the more powerful one. He was the one that was able to defy everybody and do this. And, and quite frankly, how weak the opposition is because nobody else could do what he did. But in the medium term, and what's playing out now is um, the, the divisions are coming back or they're there. And, and there was worry that this would further divide the area. Terrific. How about, how about the energy implications of all of this? Um, is the Ankara Erbil energy marriage about to uh, about to break up? Are there are there regional energy implications from all of this? I don't see. I mean, again, a lot a lot of this. That's I go back to. There's no there's no forward moving bit here. There's a lot of parts going on at one time. How can the Kurdistan regional government negotiate with Ankara? How can it negotiate with Iran and Baghdad? I don't see. Turkey completely cutting off the Kurdistan region. I just, I just can't see it, and 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 vice versa. However, I do see that again, depending how the Kurdistan regional authorities um, play this out, how Turkey can continue to pressure the Kurdistan region, and this will be a continuous pressure point to show them who is in charge. Secondly, I don't, I don't imagine the Iraqi government leaving things this way, so you'll probably likely see that second pipeline. Um, there were two pipelines uh, that were coming from the northern corridor to Turkey. One of them has, has been destroyed. With the Hawija operation completed and Daesh expelled from those areas, I would imagine if that pipeline gets restarted and fixed, that that would give the Iraqi government in Turkey more leverage as well. So. Um, in terms of the Kurdistan region being able to continue to export the oil that it does, that will be a negotiating point, and I don't see why that could stop, unless, again, Turkey decides to continue to shut and, and, and turn that off. But there's a lot of money to be made there. Yes. Uh, finally, if you would, and uh, Harith alluded to the, uh, the centrality of disputed territories in all of this. Could you zoom in a bit on, uh, on Kirkuk? its importance in the context of uh, potential uh, Kurdish independence and as a, as a potential flashpoint for uh, military confrontation. Sure. Um, Kirkuk, we don't have enough hours in the day to talk about it. Kirkuk has been central for decades before the referendum. This, w this, didn't, this problem didn't start with the referendum. It started in, in the 60s or before. Um, and it has become an issue, let's even say after 1991 and then after 2005 with the new constitution. Um, there has been territorial engineering, demographic engineering on both sides, on Arab side, on Kurdish side, so that right now you have multiple issues. You have Kirkuk between the Iraqi government and the Kurdistan regional government. You have Kirkuk between the, the, the different communities inside, Arab, Turkmen, and Kurd. And you have Kirkuk between the Kur different Kurdish parties as well. Oh, and by the way, even between and within the PUK, the Patriarch Union of Kurdistan. Even before the referendum, a day or two before or the week before, you had one, one faction within saying don't have the referendum, the other one saying we are going to have the referendum, and who's getting the oil and who's not getting the oil. So there's a lot of people who want or are seeking to uh, 
control the oil of Kirkuk, who can get the benefits of the oil of Kirkuk, whether that be the governor or other party leaders. And that's a lot of the issue going on at this time as well. How this territory, which some Kurds say it's authentically Kurdish, and then it's Turkmen and Arab, um, that's going to be resolved with all of these different parties claiming that they're the authentic owners of this territory. Thank you. Sounds like a fine kettle of fish. <sighs> fine kettle. <laughs> uh, Stu, you're the, uh, you're the perfect person to focus on, uh, on American policy in the regional context uh, of all this business. Uh, over the years, obviously, you've seen, you've seen a lot in Iraq. Uh, is this something, what we're seeing now, is this something that's truly new? in terms of uh, Arab-Kurdish tension? Was it, was it inevitable uh, that we're going to be where we are today? Uh, could anything have been done to have avoided the current crisis? Uh, thank you, Fred. Th it's great to be here. Um, great to see so many uh, friendly uh, and well-known faces in this audience. Harith, congratulations to you on uh, this important coming out. And it's a little bit of a coming out for me, too, since as you know, I've just recently left government. Um, Denise, it's great to see you. So yeah, I think, I think this was inevitable. I think, um, you know, this is something, it is certainly true what Harith and uh, Denise said, that Kurdish domestic political considerations made this uh, very favorable for Masoud Barzani at this time. But this is something that Masoud Barzani has been talking about um, for a long time. And this is, I think, uh, an objective that he has harbored since long before 2014, since long before ISIS uh, threatened the KRG and also Baghdad. So yes, this was going to happen. Uh, it reflects longstanding Kurdish uh, frustration with a lack of constitutional processes, uh, especially around disputed territories. But maybe even then, if you'd seen proce those processes move forward, I think this represents the dream of Masoud Barzani to lead the, uh, the Kurdish region to uh, independence. So, and of course, this is something that U.S. policymakers have been contending with for over a decade. Um, and we've consistently told Masoud that this is not the time. And he has consistently said, okay, when is the time? Um, and I think between 14 and 16, and, and until recently, we had a very good argument, which is this is not the time because ISIS has got to be the focus. And then he, I think, uh, he recognized that the fight against ISIS was winding down and that there was going to be a, a certain lack of leverage after that. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I think this, is, this is where we are. And I think also, I think uh, Masood has, he's, although he's clearly achieving Moving towards his objective, he's done it in a way. It's a non-binding uh, referendum. This is something that he stressed to us that was make it would make it less confrontational. I think, given where he wants to go, he has tried to make this as little confrontational as possible. Though, of course, that's not how it's perceived. That's not how it's perceived by the United States. That's not how it's perceived by the Turks and Iranians. And of course, it's not how it's perceived by Baghdad. So, uh, the question I, I read from you uh, um, is. Fred is, you know, what's next? And I think the U.S. position is, is that we now have, a, 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 it's not a drastically new situation. The lines haven't been redrawn in, in Kurdistan. There is no formal declaration of independence. There's still plenty of room for negotiation, as Harith and Denise have pointed out. And I think, you know, our role should be to encourage, you know, a reasonable now outcome to, this, to these new facts on the ground. Uh, we certainly want to avoid conflict. Um, we want to, um, you know, we want to see, we, we, we support a unified, the United States supports a unified and sovereign Iraq. Um, we've certainly respected the autonomy of Kurdistan within that context for now over a decade. Uh, how do we deal with this to avoid bloodshed, to preserve economic opportunities for the people of Iraq? How do we, how do we make sure that as this thing goes forward, people have better lives, not worse lives? Um, it's, as I say, I mean, I think when you talk to Masoud Barzani, about these issues, you would say, well, look, if you proceed, this is going to have a terrible economic cost for the KRG. And we don't know, as Denise said, you know, what the uh, exact economic effects are going to be. But there's a real risk that standard of living in Kurdistan will 
diminish as a result of this. And, um, and I don't think I'm talking out of school, uh, and uh, Bayan is here, and she can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he would say, listen, independence is an aspiration of the Kurdish people, and they are prepared to make economic sacrifices to achieve that objective. So I don't, you know, so but that said, that, you know, U.S. policy, I think, going forward should be uh, continued stability, uh, cooperation between the sides, negotiation, uh, constitutional processes, and, you know, um, avoiding to the extent possible strengthening the hand of Iran inside of, uh, inside of Iraq. Certainly strength, we, we want to avoid strengthening the hand of Iran inside of Kurdistan and also in, in the rest of Iraq. Um, Iraq's, sorry, Iran's malign influence in Iraq has been a concern of the United States policy for some time. It's insidious, it's problematic, and it, again, it is, it's holding Iraq's natural economic and social development back. Um, it fosters greater corruption, it fosters uh, human intimidation, it, it subverts the rule of law. So this is something that the Iraqis, both Kurds and uh, in other parts of Iraq, are going to have to deal with. Um, and we should ensure that this referendum does not strengthen the ir Iranian hand. Well, Stu, given, uh, given the objectives you've uh, enumerated, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you see the actual American diplomatic strategy unfolding? I mean, I look around the room here, I see people like David Mack who have done, uh, done some heavy lifting uh, in terms of American diplomacy over the years. What do you, what, what do you actually, what do you actually see in terms of in terms of this being being organized? Do you see some kind of a, a, a special envoy parachuting in? What what's how 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 do we do this? Um, no, I don't. You know, so obviously there's a lot of expertise in the U.S. government uh, on Iraq, and as, as there is uh, in this room, there's you know, Brett McGurk, one of our most effective diplomats, was in the region just prior to the referendum. He made uh, an effort, I think, to discourage to talk uh, Masoud Barzani out of proceeding with the referendum. He failed. Um, so um, I think I, I don't envision any particular diplomatic initiatives. I think, you know, coming back to something that Harris said, I think we're now in a cooling off period where I think both sides are now looking to find ways to make sure that the new facts on the ground do not precipitate a crisis or a greater crisis, do not precipitate violence, and allow and create an atmosphere that would be conducive to constructive talks. I think what we've seen, I mean, I think, let's give, uh, let's give Haider al-Abadi uh, credit for his very, I think, calibrated and wise response to this crisis. I mean, as Denise, uh, I mean, as Harith said, I mean, this could potentially be very threatening to him from a political domestic standpoint. And yet, I think he's, he's responded in a very wise way. He has, you know, he's imposed certain sanctions on, uh, on Kurdistan, which of course the Kurds don't welcome, but there's a lot more that he could have done that would have made this atmosphere a lot hotter than it is. Um, and so, uh, I, so I think that, uh, as Harith also said, I think he's, he's trying to establish uh, an atmosphere that would allow him to engage in negotiations with the Kurds, but without having to be, I think, uh, intimidated or uh, outmaneuvered uh, on his right by uh, Shia hardliners. So I think what the United States position should be, sorry, getting back to your question, is let's let this, uh, let's let this space and time, uh, let's, think, let's let things cool off, let's foster uh, an atmosphere that would be conducive to talks. Let's, um, and, you know, let's avoid, I think, you know, the sort of cataclysm uh, scenarios that Denise was characterizing. Okay, terrific. Finally, uh, just focusing a bit on the regional dimension uh, and, and two, two actors in particular, uh, Turkey and Iran, uh, both of which have rejected the referendum. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a senior Iranian official uh, told me in a small group discussion that the referendum had produced, quote, a very dangerous situation, unquote. Now, knowing where, knowing where dangers uh, often come from in this part of the world, that, that made me a bit nervous. How, how, in your view, does Washington square the circle of very cordial relations with the KRG, a NATO relationship with Turkey, and a very dim view 
of Iranian regional activities. Yeah. So one of the ironies is, uh, that's often remarked on in Iraq is that despite the, uh, the tensions and animosities between Tehran and Washington, we frequently approach challenges in Iraq from a similar perspective and frequently with the same policy uh, prescriptions. So just as you know, the United States and Iran were both adamantly opposed to this referendum, I think now, I think both sides are sort of standing back and watching to see how this is going to develop. I think uh, Turkey is the really interesting question here um, because Turkey has a lot more leverage in this situation than really any of the other uh, states because they can turn on or turn off the, the oil faucet. Um, so far, they obviously have not turned off the oil faucet. Um, it would be costly for them to do so. They, they rely on this energy significantly. Um, as Denise pointed out, there's an alternative pipeline, but that's n not close to being uh, repaired um, in the immediate future. So for at least a period of months, you know, I think, again, we're sort of in a situation where um, the regional powers and the United States are going to disapprove of the referendum but encourage some sort of, uh, some sort of political solution between Erbil and Baghdad. Um, you know, interestingly, you know, right after the referendum, there, were an, uh, there was an announcement out of Ankara of a joint military exercise with Iraq. I mean, so, th so there's a weird, so, so it's possible that the referendum will have brought Ankara and Baghdad closer together, which maybe is not such a bad thing after the really um, hot tensions uh, over Turkish military presence in northern Iraq uh, during the period of the, uh, of, of the ISIS campaign. So, you know, again, I think, uh, you know, let's, let's watch and see how each maneuvers. But there's no urgency, for example, for the Turks to take drastic action, just like there's no urgency for the United States or Iran to take drastic action. Um, I think, again, everybody's going to wait and sort of see how this plays out a little bit and try to avoid the, 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 the potential for irresponsible action by sort of um, by individual actors in some of the areas of conflict, in the disputed areas. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I please. I just want to add one thing. And, and just historically, I mean, when people, I, you know, saw Iran and t Turkey uh, having these visits over this, that is not surprising at all, because historically the one issue that brought Baghdad, Tehran, and Ankara, and Damascus at the time it was together, the one issue that brought them all together was the Kurdish issue. So we should have absolutely expected these types of revisiting of these regional states and alliances to be furnished because n each one of these states has one thing in common, that is the territorial integrity of their borders and their states. So I wouldn't have been surprised, and those types of ongoing discussions will continue. And, and, and a lot of this, too, will also be linked to Syria and some of these PKK influences that have bled over into the north of Iraq. Adith, anything to add uh, on any of this before we uh, no, I agree go to with the audience? The, I agree with Ambassador Jones and also with Dennis. Uh, I think it, uh, as, we, as we try to assess the possibility of negotiation, it's important to look at the, uh, the Turkish factor here. And whether, uh, despite of the rhetorical escalation from Erdogan, it's still uh, the, the uh, Turkey did not take very uh, drastic steps in, in, in dealing with this issue. He, he threatened to halt the flow of oil f from Kurdistan. Uh, I, I think is this is unlikely because it means that Turkey will lo lose some of its leverage over, K over KRG. Uh, but if he, if he did that, he will significantly alter the balance of, of power between Baghdad and, and, uh, and Erbil. Um, my, my assessment is that uh, what Turkey wants is, yes, they don't want the independence of Kurdistan, but they don't want Baghdad to take, uh, to, to, to restore authority over Kurdistan. So they agree minimally on preventing the formation of the Kurdish state, a statehood, but it's been, uh, uh, it's been one of the objectives of Turkish foreign policy in the region uh, to have Kurdistan and northern Iraq as it's a sphere of influence for Turkey. Uh, I'm there where the two sides will be part. Thank you. From Turkey. Yeah, 
Uh, just one thing about Turkey, the, um, and this was a public, uh, by the way, my, my statements are my own and not those of the government or the NDU, I should have said that earlier. The, the day after I came back from, from Iraq and I spent several days in Baghdad, I, and this was a public dinner, I had part of the small group dinner with President Erdogan in Ankara, and, sorry, in New York when everybody was there. And this was an interesting dinner and discussion because the, the, the language uh, about this, and, and they were talking a lot of concern was about the referendum and about the enhancement of Kurdish um, territorial gains and political gains in, nor in northeast Syria, um, was that, that this was not going to happen. But it was, you know, a, a lot of it was tied to they didn't get the, the, the PKK out of northern Iraq that this relationship between uh, the Iraqi government and, and Turkey, it was, it was more than um, we have to just push back th this independence call. It was to affirm, I, I can't enhance enough, to affirm the territorial integrity of these states, that Turkey's threat perception is entirely tied up to these borders and it's linked to Syria as well. So there's a lot of pressure also coming from inside Turkey and some of this is to appeal to the nationalist constituencies inside Turkey as well um, at this time. Denise, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to you now for questions. Uh, we've, got about, uh, we've got about 30 minutes. Uh, there, is not, uh, there is not going to be a uh, roving microphone. Uh, we're not going to do that. So uh, if you wish to ask a question, please raise your hand. I will recognize you. And uh, please, uh, uh, if, if you would, uh, stand up, state your, your name, your affiliation, pose your question as briefly as possible, and if possible, designate uh, whom on the, on the panel you'd, uh, you'd like uh, to respond. Yes, sir. Thank you. This, uh, this question focuses on the, uh, on the role of uh, Iran and allied, uh, allied militias uh, in, the, uh, in the disputed areas. Anybody, anybody you'd like to tackle that? Denise? I'll just um, thank you for your question. The, my understanding of that the, there's two main entities controlling the oil in Kirkuk. One of them is the Kurdistan Regional Government, uh, and the other yeah. is the North Oil Company. The vast majority of those oil reserves right now are being uh, under the de facto control of the Kurdistan Regional Authority. I do agree with you that it's not only between Baghdad and Erbil. It, it, it still is, but between entities within and then within the Kurdish parties. But any pumping of uh, any oil that goes to any of these militia groups, and obviously there are very big differences between militia groups. There are the vast majority of militia in Iraq uh, the p popular mobilization forces are legal entities within the Iraqi security forces, about 10 to 30 percent, depending who you ask, are under Iran's influence. Those 10 to 30 percent, I don't know if they're controlling. You'd have to ask the, no the, the, the that's, no, that's not accurate. Um, are they controlling, th is the Kurdistan regional government, which controls most of it, giving it to the Shia militia? I don't think so. I would question that. And then does the North Oil Company, have it, has it ceded its control to some of these? And I'm, I'm not aware of that. So those, m those Peshmerga groups that control those oil fields would be the ones that have the most authority and, and the North Oil Company. So uh, I think the problem here is that uh, if one side decides to uh, create its own realities in those territories, of course it will incentivize the other side to do the same. So it's, it's, it's a reciprocal. Uh, so the, the two sides have to be restrained. But just one, one, one comment on the Iranian part of it. I mean, 
there is no question that Iran has a huge influence in Iraq. But if anything, this referendum will do, or, or the coalition defendants, is, will, is to increase this, this uh, influence. Uh, the narrative of KDP, the Kurd Kurdistan Democratic Party, especially the narrative that is produced here in Washington, uh, is that Iraq is fully controlled today by Iran. Uh, I even heard it probably was uh, David Pollack citing Barzani as saying that, believe me, we are not separating from Iraq, we are separating from Iran. The irony is that this, this narrative is, 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 is coming at a time when we see that in, in, the, in the internal dynamic of the Shia alliance, of the Shia politics, is changing. We saw Abadi um, is trying to be more independent uh, as compared to his predecessor. He, he went to Saudi Arabia, he visited several Gulf states. Uh, Sadr, Muqtada Sadr took strong positions against the factions that are supported by, by Tehran. Sistani, just recently, Mahmoud Shahru, Hashimi Shahrodi, a senior official in Iran and a potential successor of Khamenei, visited Iraq and Sistani refused to meet him. That's also a big signal. So it is in exactly in the time when you see Kurd uh, Shia, Shia politics are uh, more inclined to, uh, towards uh, emphasizing the independence of Iraq, towards integrating Iraq in, in, in its region, improving relations with the Arab state. The KDB is uh, trying to emphasize that the fact uh, that Tehran is, 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 is controlling Baghdad. And to be more cynical, I think, the biggest free, uh, fear of the, K of the KDP is not Baghdad that is dominated by Tehran but Baghdad that is integrated in, the, in its region, in the global economy, and has good relations with the West, because this Baghdad will undermine some of the value of uh, Erbil. I, I, I want to emphasize, that's a great point Harith made, that if anything what the referendum did was to reinforce some, let me use the word, undisciplined militia in the midst of discipline. The undisciplined ones um, have reacted I, when I said before about the ex extreme groups reacting to, we will now, this gives us another reason to remain here after Daesh to protect these territories or to keep these territories. The last thing that I would see that Iran or any extremer group wants is a civil state. And there are calls in Iraq, I, I've spoken to many Iraqis from Baghdad and, and around that are seeking a civil state and to move away from sectarianism. Um, it's not everywhere but it is certainly a trend in Iraq right now. Um, and, and a final point about the, the Iran, if everything is, there is, uh, there is Iranian influences in Iraq through demographic changes, through some of these militia, through trying to buy loyalties of different Arab groups. I've seen it and I've spoken to people, but everything is not under Iranian influence, which means nothing, that, that means it undermines the argument. And if there's a party that has to be concerned about Iranian I militia influences is the PUK because most of the disputed territories that they controlled are in that area. And what one of some folks told me was the concern with the referendum and the warnings or the threats from Iran were, up until this point, they actually had mediated disputes between the Hastashab and the PUK Peshmerga when it was tense. This now, they said, if you do this, we won't be there to mediate for you. And so that would be also a concern, but that would fall upon many of these areas in the PUK. So be careful about saying all of this is Iran, but even some of the, the useful things it could have done will now be taken away as well. Yeah, I just want to pick on some of these themes because <coughs> I think it's a really important question and, and really good answer. So s whether or not Shia militias are controlling individual oil fields, that's something uh, that's beyond my knowledge. But um, Certainly, we know that the Quds Force has been involved in the illicit uh, oil trade in Iraq for over a decade, and in fact, uh, used it to fund their uh, illegal uh, operations uh, during the time of the sanctions on Iran. So that is something that is certainly a malign influence on Iraq. It's costing its people billions and billions of dollars every year. Um, but I think, you know, picking up on Harvest's point, I mean, you know, there there is a sense. Uh, all my, during all of my time in Iraq, there is a sense among the Iraqi people that they want balance in this relationship. They, they can't, uh, you know, 
like Mexico, you know, maybe wouldn't like to be a, a neighbor of the United States sometimes. Uh, the uh, Iraqis probably have a, a great deal of ambivalence about being uh, situated next to Iran, but there's nothing they can do about it, right? So, um, so they do want balance, but they want balance in that relationship, and I think it's, again, very heroic of Haider al-Abadi to, you know, foster this uh, rapprochement with, with Riyadh, uh, with the first Adel Joubert's visit to Baghdad, and then uh, the Prime Minister's visit, and then now uh, uh, Ibrahim Jafri has been in Abu Dhabi in the last week. Um, this, this, the, the trade openings with the openings of the uh, border gates in, uh, to Saudi Arabia, the work now that's being done to reopen the road between Amman and Baghdad, these are all important steps led by the Prime Minister, I think, to create ballast in, in the relationship. And this is certainly something that U.S. policy, policy has supported and should con continue to support. But what worries me, Harith, and I'd be welcome, I'd welcome your thoughts on this, is, you know, as we come up on this 2018 election, you know, is a body going to get credit for this, or are the, uh, because it feels like uh, the leaders of the hardline uh, Shia groups, the Shia militia groups, uh, have gotten a lot of very positive media, especially through the Iranian propaganda machine, and are benefiting um, in this sort of in this new sort of early days of this election cycle, and so it's it's possible to see that you know this important leadership that Hyderabadi has exercised and has provided during this very difficult time will not be rewarded at the polls, and instead um, that you know hardline Shia who uh, have associated themselves with the fight in some cases exaggerated their contribution to the fight uh, will benefit at the polls. H how do you see that issue? If you don't mind me asking the question yeah. myself. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I, I fully agree. And I, I think one of the bad inclination, inclinations that uh, evolved in Iraqi politics in the last decade is that when you want to win over a, your constituency, you have to adopt the most hawkish position. So people will think that you are a strong leader and the, that you are defending their, the, the defending their interests. And here, Abadi is actually like uh, is, is, is facing a uh, very difficult challenge in, in creating s a balance between his need to, to appear as strong and tough and defending his own constituencies because unfortunately at the end each of one of those leaders has to focus on his political uh, chances within his own sectarian or uh, ethnic constituency. But at the same time uh, it's not his battle to, I don't think he will win a battle if he just want to appear as tough and strong. He could win the battle as to, uh, w if, if he tries to appear as tough, but at the same time realistic, because the other factor is not, it's not that all the, the people demanding uh, more haw hawkish attitude, but also the people demanding solutions. They, they, they are tired of, of, of conflict. And if, if Abadi is, uh, will, will manage to, to create this balance, uh, I think this will play uh, in his hands during. If, if there will be, by, by the way, you're talking about the election. Uh, still, the electoral law hasn't passed yet. There, there are disagreements about the, electoral, about the election commission. Uh, so we are not sure yet whether there will be parliamentary election into in April 2018. Most likely there will be, but I think this is still early in Baghdad's watch. Mm -hmm. I, I just want, I want to <laughs> add, Stu, um, one of the other trends, in it, in, alongside some of this lingering ethno-sectarian, and this, the other important trend in Iraq is a move toward a civil state, as I indicated. So you've got some of the, ref the large reformist movements, the Sadrists, which have the streets, um, the extent to which uh, uh, Prime Minister Abadi can, will take, can, 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 build upon that, okay? And if that trend, that civil state movement trend can enhance a body's power, then that would be the part that's pushing back the Maliki group. Of the 150 registered entities for the election, 76, for example, have the word civil in it or civilian. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that may, that's just a nomenclature change. There is some real strong movement, and many of these political parties are enhancing. So how, how can Prime Minister Abadi take advantage of that as well to push back some of these nefarious influence. Thank you. We have a question from the back, then one up front, and then you're next.
there were a couple of questions there. One is about the uh, one is about the uh, I take it to be the relative uh, strength of Russian support uh, for Kurdistan, and the other is the uh, the relationship between ISIS and uh, Shia militias. Stu, you want to start it off? Well, I think it's easy. Uh, I think Russia has the luxury of having no responsibility. So Russia can uh, uh, can play whatever uh, role it wants to play, knowing that at the end of the day, that the United States is going to be have a fundamental responsibility for the health and welfare of the people of Iraq, both in the KRG and uh, in in the rest of the country. So, um, you know, Russia is, has aligned itself with the Iranian interests uh, in the region, in Syria, and elsewhere. And um, and you know, let's let's be clear. I mean, Russia during the uh, civil war in Syria has, has shot uh, ballistic missiles over Kurdish territory, um, endangering the people of Kurdistan with those weapons without any regard or consultation with the, people, with the, with the leaders of Kurdistan. So this is a purely opportunistic play on the part of Moscow, and I think should be seen in that light. Denise, you want to take a yeah. shot at the militia question? Well, I mean, nice to see you again, by the way. Um, ISIS, we all know what ISIS, Adash, is, which is a terrorist group that has brutalized tens and thousands of people, hundreds and thousands of people. So I, I don't need to give everyone a lesson on that. But I do want to spend a little bit more time on, on, on the Shia militia and that word in the phrase. As I indicated before, there's a big difference between both, and it depends who you talk, which ones you're talking about. The, the Hash Dishab, formerly known as the Popular Mobilization Forces, is about 140,000 popular mobilization forces. 100,000 of those are Shia, about, and about 40,000 comprise Sunni Arabs and other minority groups. The vast majority, and uh, on the low end, it's 70 percent, 75 percent, on the high end, it's 90, um, responded to a fatwa by Grand Ayatollah Sistani. They are considered disciplined and part of these Iraqi security forces or the Iraqi official Iraqi military and they are working hand in hand with other groups. It's so those th they're they're not ISIS and they're they, and many by the way in this point of time and the very many people I spoke to in Baghdad and elsewhere they are not going anywhere. They are considered revered. I mean there's even a place in the Kishla right now in Baghdad where you can hear poetry and poems and, and discussions about the the, the Hashta shop. It's the 10 to 20 or 30 percent that are a concern, and those you can say are the undisciplined, nefarious, IRGC-backed. Uh, they are the big troublemakers. Um, they are the ones that obviously right now are feeding upon some of these ungoverned spaces, um, paying off people, buying loyalties, getting houses and things, and, and infiltrating. So that would be the concern. Um, but I wouldn't, again, that's a, a, and, and, as people tell me, kidnapping and doing a lot of these other bad things, okay? So I'm not going to in any way say that they're not um, terrible, but the, the way of saying that these are exactly like ISIS too, I think that that's, it's just two different problems. But it's not the Shia militia, and I think it would be far more helpful to talk about these undisciplined IRGC-backed militia, and as opposed to keep saying over and over again, the Shia militia, because it's just not um, getting at the point. And it, th I don't see them going away either. Yes, sir. Uh, this question, uh, for those of you who didn't hear it, has to do with are there are there serious are there serious uh, conversations ongoing between Erbil and Baghdad now about uh, about specific constitutional uh, arrangements? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but th th there are attempts to uh, mediate between the two sides. Uh, uh, as I said, the Speaker of Parliament was in, in Erbil. Uh, the two vice presidents, Alawi and Najafi, were there, and the focus now on trying to de-escalate the situation, which is uh, which is a good point to start with. But if, uh, and I, I agree with you, th th it's important to have this uh, serious conversation. Uh, but if you let Iraqi parties by by themselves, I don't I don't think they will have it. 
it's obviously you now this is not an Iraqi crisis only. It's it's a regional and international crisis. So uh, uh, the United States, the, the United Nations, and other regional powers have have to step in, and there has to be some coordinated action in order to uh, create the atmosphere for uh, negotiation. And already we we know that. Uh, uh, Brett Magurk, uh, the U UN, uh, the representative of the Secretary General of the UN, and other U.S. ambassadors met Barzani before their friend, um, and they offered him what they thought it was uh, an alternative. Barzani thought that was not enough for him, but we this could be revived at at some point. Uh, so I think if, uh, there, w there, w there will be some weeks, uh, probably months, uh, passing in which. Uh, the two the two sides will try to test their uh, their limits, but at some point there 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 will have to be some uh, kind of international uh, encouragement and probably guarantees Iran to uh, also to start uh, negotiation. Okay, back here and then over to uh, David Mack and then. Okay, question focuses on the uh, on the roles of uh, Sadr and uh, Sistani. Um, I think both uh, adopted more moderate uh, position with regard to this crisis. Of course, neither could uh, could appear as uh, if if they are less uh, committed to the unity of Iraq because the 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 Kurdish step has been framed as a threat to the unity of Iraq, so both in their statements emphasize the unity of Iraq, but both realize that uh, there is the threat of the most radical elements in in, in the, the pro-Iranian elements, uh, particularly could steal the show if, if, if things escalate and there will be conflict. So they are both urging some, uh, some caution, uh, caution and not to take ra radical steps. And that's, that's, that, that's very good, I think. Uh, both are supportive of uh, Abadi in general. And this support is very important for him in order to 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 face the the pressure coming from the hardliners. Yeah. David. Okay, David's intervention has to do with uh, with his with his view that the Kurdish perception over the years uh, consistently has been one uh, of the U.S. Uh, eventually eventually coming around uh, to support uh, Kurdish positions, uh, notwithstanding an official position uh, that uh, downplays independence. Uh, and is there anything uh, anything practically we can do? to uh, avoid uh, misleading our Kurdish friends, Stu? Well, I think that's a great question. And I think um, it's, you know, it's important to remember that the Kurds have been essential partners in the region and have been essential partners in fighting ISIS. So 
for example, that did lead to the fact that the United States then offered to spend, you know, $400 million in stipends to uh, Kurdish fighters, uh, to Peshmerga fighters during this crisis. Um, all of that went through the government in Baghdad. All of that required the approval of uh, Prime Minister Abadi. And I think that was exactly how it should work. And I think, you know, although it's a, certainly an irritation for the Kurds um, that uh, key decisions involving the region uh, go through Baghdad, we need to continue to, to do that. Um, and, you know, a, another piece of your question, though, I think, David, is that um, – there, I think there is a range of views w in Washington and in our political community on Kurdistan. And there are p members of Congress who – there is a Kurdish ca caucus in Congress, and there's members of that caucus who, uh, you know, don't believe that we should go through Baghdad uh, on Peshmerga stipends or on sending, you know, military support to Kurdistan. And they're very vocal. And I think that uh, those voices can sometimes be uh, amplified and misunderstood. So uh, I think that's just – that's just – part of our political landscape, and there's nothing really to be done about it. Um, you know, Kurds have a tremendous presence here in Washington. They're very effective on the Hill. They're very effective in their communication strategy. Uh, they're sophisticated. They, they know us well. So I don't think that they are being misled, though I do think that they are uh, sometimes uh, like to uh, amplify those voices to gain political traction domestically. Can I add, I, I fully agree. Uh, Thanks, David, for your question. I fully agree with, uh, with Stu that um, I think the United States has been perfectly clear. There has been not, not one point has U.S. policy moved a needle on this issue. Now, has media, journalists, uh, you know, think tank people, have they written stories or articles that have gotten out there and sensationalized and build on this romantic idea? Certainly. But U.S. policy hasn't changed whether or not at all and whether and even on this referendum whether or not certain individuals congress people or other make a statement that's their business but that's not u.s policy secondly um whether or not everyone's free to to write what they want whether local press wants to manipulate people's opinions on the ground and saying well the united states is going to do this uh, that's, again, not our responsibility. That's th the responsibility of Kurdish leaders, to be honest with their people. T to, to be, to, but, but your point still about is the, is the signaling different and does it, how much does it matter to us? It was interesting that when I was in Baghdad and there was people we were talking to on the streets, people, many people said we were surprised about your – we were happy and surprised about your s clear statement that you were against us because everyone thought that you were here to break up Iraq. So, again, th that's just the way people interpret it. But if you look at statement by statement, I don't see how the United States couldn't have been clearer. And, and you can even and, – and so it's a, if you look at the Kurds in Syria, whom I talked to, it's perfectly clear to them that we're not going to sponsor uh, their entity. And they're not feeding on that so as much as what was going on because they were able to in the north because of all this lobbying.
Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, this is no, it's actually it's actually very it's actually very clear. Thank you. It's a, a, a statement from the KRG rep. Uh, wondering first, you know, why, why, did, why was the United States' reaction to all of this so vehement? Uh, have we, uh, have we, inadvertently stirred up some uh, negative uh, local actors? And is uh, is wait and see good enough? Uh, should the United States be uh, be doing something positive? Uh, this one is for uh, this one is for Stu Jones, and uh, with with your reply, we will bring things to a close. Well, thanks. I think thanks for being here, Bayan. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it's an interesting question uh, and a fair question. I mean, you know, one man's vehemence is another man's, you know, uh, laissez-faire, right? I mean, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, the United States was very clear ahead of the referendum that we were opposed to the referendum. And um, I think, you know, there has to now be an understanding that, uh, that this went forward uh, over U.S. objections. Okay, that said, you're right. Eventually, the United States is going to have to play some sort of role in helping to mediate the, the, between the parties. But um, I think there needs to be an atmosphere for that, and it's not clear that that atmosphere exists today. I mean, if uh, um, I haven't talked to Brett about this, but I'm sure that if we discussed it, um, uh, we would agree quickly that, that right now we have to let things sort out a little bit. I would say uh, the, the only thing I would offer in addition to that is this. I mean, um, what are the U.S. objectives in this? I don't want to come back to what I said in the original, my original opening statement, which, you know, what are our major concerns? Obviously, we want to avoid violence. Um, we want to preserve, uh, you know, the gains that we've made against ISIS in Iraq. And also, we don't want to empower Iran or Iran's proxies inside of Iraq. And I think that, um, you know, I think our position uh, on this referendum uh, reflects that. And, I, you know, I, I wouldn't expect you to be understanding or appreciative of the uh, embargo on the flights or the, um, or the military drills, and I understand your concern about that. But I would characterize that as a calibrated Baghdad response that's conducive to moving towards a more constructive dialogue between Baghdad and Erbil. Um, so I think, again, as I said earlier, I think there are measures that Prime Minister Abadi could have taken that would have made that process more difficult and made it harder to get to dialogue. So I think that he's clearly trying to position himself as both uh, operating from a position of strength but also a position of reasonableness, and um, which is his nature, you know, which is his nature. And I do think that uh, he and uh, President Barzani will be able to find a, a way forward on this. And that's certainly something that the United States should support at the appropriate moment. Thank you. Stu, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, the tenor of this conversation today reminds me of something a, uh, a rather colorful former business partner of mine named Rich Armitage once said, and that is that a, a, good, a good conversation is like a, is like a good beef stew, all meat, no potatoes. And, and I, I think that's what we've had today, is an all meat, no potatoes conversation. The sort of thing I really want to see over the next, uh, the next four years uh, with the Iraq program here that, uh, that Hadith is, uh, is going to be leading. So with that, thank you all very much for taking time today. And please join me in thanking our, uh, our participants.